She was just like any teenager in the 90s, with her black lipstick and her gangster rap and her continuous attempts to fit in. But sometimes looking up to the wrong girls has its price. This is the story of Rena Virk, the Canadian teenager who was killed by her own group of friends. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you for joining me for the first time if you're new here, and hello to the usual rapscallions and reprobates. Please consider subscribing or joining me on Patreon if you'd like to hear more true crime stories. Today's story took place in View Royal, a little area outside of Victoria, British Columbia, where murders just didn't happen. And I know that's how every murder documentary begins, but really, according to the book that I've taken most of my story from, Under the Bridge by Rebecca Godfrey, this place was so unmurdery that the killers were legitimately going around telling people what they did, and it still took a week in November 1997 for anyone to think, hey, maybe we should look for this girl. The girl was 14-year-old Rena Virk, born in that small Canadian town to Indian parents on March 10, 1983. To understand everything that comes later, you have to know that Rena was a little bit different from everyone else from the get-go. There was a community of 3,000 Sikhs in the area, but Rena's mom had converted from Hinduism to Jehovah's Witness when she moved to Canada. My understanding is that Jehovah's Witnesses are Christians who believe that the end of the world is nigh and everyone needs to accept God to fix this morally corrupt society. They don't believe in the Holy Trinity, don't believe in blood transfusions, won't serve in the military, and won't celebrate any of those ghastly holidays that originated from pagan beliefs, such as the dreaded Christmas. They're sort of like Scientologists in that they'll full-on shun anyone who breaks the rules. They do believe in Jesus, even if they don't think he's a big deal like God is, but they think he died on a post rather than a cross. And they think only a select few get to go to heaven, so good luck if you're not one of the chosen 144,000. Their leaders have been accused of mind-controlling believers into unquestioning obedience. So this was the backdrop for Rena Virk's childhood. She wasn't a Sikh like the rest of her community, and her family was part of this strict religion that was also unusual. One author called her family a minority within a minority. Knowing how teenage girls are, this probably made her just want to fit in all the more. She didn't want to take part in the joyless religion of her parents, just wanted to have birthday parties and paint her nails and listen to gangster rap like the other kids. But even with candy forbidden in their home, she was considered overweight as a ninth grader when thin and blonde were the things girls wanted to be. One family friend called her quiet and needy. This source said that Rena was a good kid who got involved with the wrong crowd. She wasn't getting the attention she craved at home, so she turned to friends who would accept her. These friends were what we might call gang adjacent. Maybe not in the gangs, but trying to be, and Rena was impressed by that. Of course, the local police constable said that any kids hanging out on a street corner were viewed as being in a gang in that tiny town. Even the ones who called themselves the Crips probably weren't related to the LA Crips at all. After the murder occurred on November 14, 1997, the police only heard that something had happened. The school rumor mill was buzzing, whispers were flying around town about a girl being killed, but no one had actually told the police what to blame anyone for. It was like they had their suspects, but no crime. Four days later, investigators began their search with a dive and air team, but only some vague tips to go on. The first thing they found in the gorge waterway was Rena's underwear. It was the following day, Saturday, that a Coast Guard helicopter spotted the floating body at 1 p.m. The coroner said the impact to the torso from all of the kicks and punches was akin to being run over by a car. There was a bruise shaped like a sneaker on the back of her brain. At first, people were saying it was a gang initiation. Others said Rena came across a bunch of people drinking and they beat her for no reason. Someone said the girl had bragged about being a gang member and actual members of the gang beat her up for lying. One person claimed that the killers were drinking at a park, randomly came across the victim and dropped rocks on her head, kicked her in the neck and pushed her body into the water. Eventually, tips from friends and onlookers came in that led them straight to the suspects. Eight teenagers were arrested. They had their first appearance in court on November 24, 1997, seven girls and one boy ranging in age from 14 to 16. They were junior high schoolers who were all known to hang out together, many from broken homes. Seven of them were charged with aggravated assault and one of them with second-degree murder, but their names were kept confidential under the Young Offenders Act. They were eighth, ninth, and 10th graders, but detectives and prosecutors wondered if some of them should be charged as adults. 
Rena's mom said that just hours before she disappeared, Rena called and said she wanted to come home. Her mom wasn't sure if Rena meant for the night or forever, but it didn't matter. Her parents described Rena as kind and caring, the type of person who would help the less fortunate because she was fulfilled by the love and support of her family. But Rena had been taken in by social services a year prior when her mom says she started acting out like all teenagers do. She was caught in that limbo of trying to become an adult while living under the too strict rules of religious parents who, of course, just wanted the best for her. She would run away from home or accuse her father of assault to hopefully be placed in a less strict foster care. Her parents warned her about hanging out with people who might have different values, but she just wanted to be normal and have friends, any friends. Rena was called a habitual runaway, kind of a tough girl. She had only been at her school for a few days at the time of the murder after moving in with a new foster family, and students said she was busy trying to tag along and fit in. Some people just didn't like her. Some people found her annoying. She had recently started experimenting with drugs just to be part of the group. Rena met Nicole and Missy at a group home one time when she had run away, and she was immediately smitten with these rebellious girls who painted their nails and stole cars. Nicole would make Rena wait outside her room at the house, the suspense and longing building, until the pretty blonde would finally let Rena come in and hang out. But things went south between them. Rena started dating Missy's ex-boyfriend, wearing his jacket around town. And then Rena stole Nicole's address book and began calling her friends, telling them to watch out that Nicole had AIDS. And then she called one of the boys from school using Nicole's address book to tell him that she, Rena, had a crush on him. You have to sort of admire her for being so brave in junior high, calling up a boy and admitting her crush, but she was aggressive and annoying about it, calling him 15 times until he finally agreed to meet her at the candy store that night. He never actually intended to go, and he didn't even really do it to be mean. He just needed to get this girl to leave him alone. Asking nicely hadn't stopped her from calling repeatedly. Hearing that Rena had called this boy using her address book was the final straw for Nicole. Her mom heard her call a friend and hatch a murder plan, although it seemed jokey and giggly at the time, nothing serious. But then her mom didn't hear it when Nicole called another friend to ask if she wanted to help beat up some girl. Maybe her mom would have taken it seriously then. This friend said sure, because they always threatened to beat up girls and never really went through with it. That Friday night, the night of the murder, Nicole and Missy invited Rena to a party in a park near their school where all the kids hung out. Rena showed up in jeans and a black t-shirt. There was a full moon and beautiful streaks in the sky from where a Russian rocket had exploded. Almost all of the students were from the same school, kids who had dated each other and drank with each other long before Rena met Nicole at the group home. A girl who was trained in martial arts showed up in the field where they were all hanging out and announced, I'm here to fight a girl. Her name starts with an R or an S. Rena, having heard rumors that she was a wanted woman, started to run, but the girls caught up with her, surrounded her. Nicole and Missy and this girl who knew martial arts and their friends. Nicole screamed that Rena was ruining her life and put out a lit cigarette on Rena's forehead. Rena tried to hit back, but the other girls converged, punching her, pushing her down, beating her. A girl named Kelly grabbed Rena's hair to get a better grip as she hit Rena in the face over and over. A boy came running up from out of nowhere and kicked Rena in the head. He didn't even know her. Rena was kicked until she slid off some stairs into the mud face down. She kept pleading with them to stop and said she was sorry. The girl who knew martial arts, the toughest girl, seemed to take pity on her and told everyone to stop. No one helped Rena as she struggled past them, beaten and bloody, her eyes swollen shut, and started toward home. The girls left too, checking back into their group home or riding the bus back home. Those who lived with their parents wouldn't tell their parents what happened to keep them from worrying. One of the girls knew she'd have to warn her friend about how that girl's boyfriend had violently kicked a girl in the head after she'd left. Everyone went back and settled into their little suburban lives that night, but Rena never came home. From the very beginning, none of the girls could shut up about the murder. One of them told a random boy at the bus stop that night that she and friends had just killed someone. Nicole told her new roommate at the group home. Two of the girls asked the school principal for a newspaper because they wanted to see if anything had been written about their missing friend. Everyone thought the girls were weird and making things up. It was the new roommate from the group home who told the police what she'd heard, and when she mentioned a girl named Kelly, the police knew just who she meant. There was only one Kelly at the local school, and that Kelly was no good. Investigators brought in one of Kelly's friends, and this girl's mom pleaded with her to help a fellow mother find her child. The girl broke down and immediately told everything she knew. The police had their eight names. 
Detectives brought in the girlfriend of the boy who had kicked Rena in the head that night, a bleached blonde kid named Warren who wore baggy white jeans with thick cuffs. The girlfriend said Warren told her he and Kelly killed Rena, that Kelly kicked her, stepped on her head, and drowned her by holding her head underwater for five minutes. He told her he and Kelly threw Rena into the river, and her pants came off as they dragged her into the water by her feet. His girlfriend was so in shock that, at the time, she thought he must be making it up. The 18 pebbles found in Rena's lungs proved that the drowning was no lie. When investigators brought in Warren, he admitted that Kelly wanted to go talk to Rena after the fight, to follow Rena across the bridge and deal with her. They found Rena sitting under the bridge, and Kelly wanted to know if she was sorry for all of the trouble she caused. They made Rena take off her shoes and coat before beating her up and smashing her head against a tree. Kelly kicked her head and ribs until Rena choked on her own blood, and then Warren dragged her 10 feet toward the water until Kelly took over. He said what he was responsible for on a scale from 1 to 10 was a 3, and what Kelly did was a 7. In court, the teenage suspects seemed most upset that they weren't allowed to contact their friends while on house arrest. The media branded the girls charged with assault the Shoreline Six after the name of their school. Only three of the girls had actually gone to the Shoreline Junior High School, but the Shoreline Three plus three other girls from another school isn't as catchy. In the end, the girls were found guilty of assault causing bodily harm. Three of them pleaded guilty. The other three pleaded not guilty, but were convicted at a trial that lasted only three days. Two of the girls got one year in jail, three got six months, and one got 60 days for slapping Rena. In a separate trial, Warren was charged with second-degree murder, causing harm that was likely to result in death. A judge found him guilty. As Warren was taken from the courtroom, he accidentally locked eyes with Rena's little brother, and the sadness in this glance made him realize the seriousness of what he'd done. Warren Glowatsky was sentenced to life in prison. Kelly, who Warren said did the actual drowning that killed Rena, pleaded not guilty. To be more precise, she actually pleaded innocent and claimed that she was being framed. She said she never crossed the bridge that night, never went after Rena after everyone else had gone home. Fifteen teenagers were called as witnesses against Kelly, but her lawyers argued that each of them was a drunk, on heroin since the age of 15, or in love with Warren and couldn't be trusted to tell the truth about his role in the murder. Kelly, this brat who hissed at authority, had transformed herself into a sweet, sympathetic character. She seemed genuinely sad on the stand to onlookers as she lamented those 15 people, her friends, accusing her. People worried she was going to get away with it. But Killer Kelly, as the newspapers nicknamed her, was found guilty. The judge, saying that Kelly had a wonderful family and no previous record, sentenced her to the minimum of five years in jail. But then her lawyers appealed right after the trial, and almost immediately she was sent home to live under house arrest. The judge said she was no threat to society. But a new trial was eventually ordered because a judge found that the prosecution had questioned Kelly improperly in her first trial. Questions like, what reason would these people have to frame you, he said, undermined the presumption of innocence. Kelly was eventually sent back to jail to await her trial, though, after she beat up an older lady she claimed stole her phone. Her new trial started on June 14, 2004, with all of the witnesses a little grown up and a little wiser. They understood now the weight of what they'd done to Rena. And this time, even though there was still the threat of being called a rat and getting taken out in prison, Warren agreed to testify against Kelly for the first time. He said he had an obligation to Rena's family. On the stand, Warren said that when Rena showed a little sign of life after Kelly dragged her into the water that night, Kelly karate chopped her throat and held her head underwater. Kelly again tried to make herself seem sweet and innocent at trial, a proper lady who was being forced to take the blame for all of her friends. One of my favorite little notes from the trial is that on the stand, Kelly was trying to seem so prim and concise that she would sometimes slip into a British accent. But the prosecutor was so relentless, so skilled, that at one point Kelly screamed, you can stop, you've got what you wanted, I'm obviously going to get convicted. But one juror was a holdout on convicting her for so long that somehow, unbelievably, a mistrial was declared. But finally, in April 2005, at her third trial, Kelly Ellard was found guilty of second-degree murder. Her Calvin Klein jacket with the dried white saltwater marks finally convinced the jury. Warren spent his time in prison reading, learning about restorative justice, and acquiring the skills to help edit a documentary. After meeting him and sensing his genuine regret and empathy, Rena's family attended his day parole hearing in 2007 and didn't try to stop his release. 
They say that although they reconciled with him, it's not possible to say it's a happy ending for them. Warren was let out on full parole in June 2010 at the age of 29. Kelly has been up for parole twice. Both times she's talked about how motherhood has changed her and given her fresh eyes to see the world with. Because for some reason, 33-year-old Kelly was allowed a conjugal visit with a 41-year-old ex-convict pen pal she became close to while serving her time. Before the baby was born, he was back in jail. But Kelly says her son has helped her end her assaults on corrections officers, her crystal meth addiction, and her homemade shiv making. She got her GED, worked at the prison library, and eventually admitted that she drowned Rena. In 2017, she was given day parole on the condition that she stay off drugs and get mental health treatment. She was allowed to be out during the day and had to return to her halfway house at night to live with her child. Her name is now Carrie Marie Sim, and as of September 2022, she's 40 years old, has two children, and is still on day parole. The Parole Board of Canada has called her unworthy of moving to full parole. Sometimes it's hard to remember what it's like being a teenager when so many of us just wanted to be normal and fit in. I mean, not me. I was a band geek who liked alt-rock music, but you know what I'm saying. I think these kids got caught up in the moment and got swept away by the momentum of the crowd into some sort of mob mentality. A lot of their parents were in denial that their children could do such a thing, if their parents were even there at all. You see it in the way the kids were mostly just worried about getting to talk to their friends or their boyfriends while being interviewed by the police. Some of them said their friends were only involved in the beating, like it was okay as long as they weren't the ones to kill Rena. They said that girls were always fighting each other, like it's fine because it's normal. Kelly said that if she did anything wrong, she did it for her friends, to please and protect the group, maybe to keep Rena from ratting on them. In the interviews with the kids, I'm just struck by exactly how childish they were. One 14-year-old said she loved to party as much as the next person. Like, I know I'm a nerd, but you love to party at 14 years old? What does that even mean to you? As the judge in Warren's trial said, violence is not a recreational activity. In Punjabi, the name Rina means mirror or looking glass. You have to wonder what these people see of themselves when they reflect on Rena's beating and murder. In the years following her death, Rena's parents actively worked on anti-bullying campaigns with the Canadian government, and they were awarded for their contributions. Rena's mom sadly died in 2018 from a choking accident at the age of 58. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. Do you think times have changed at all since this happened in 1997, or has teenage bullying gotten even worse? Have you ever seen the mob mentality in action? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube video. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you like spending this time together. I'd be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime.